the Golden Globe winning and Academy Award nominated screenwriter of 12 Years a Slave, Mr. John Ridley. It's a lot of people here, some people have seen it, and some people saw it for the first time today. And, I mean, it can really only be described as just an experience, an experience. Well, thank you, and, and first of all, thank you for, for coming out and sharing this experience this afternoon. It's deeply appreciated. Um, I think the things that people see and feel when they see this film, first and foremost, uh, what you are seeing and feeling are, it's Solomon Northup and his words and his work and his life uh, and the way that he was able to survive this ordeal without bitterness and without hatred. And as powerful as this film is and as beautifully made as I, th I think it is and as wonderful as the performances are, I, I always, when I'm at events like this or in public, I just encourage people to really read this memoir because you know, honestly, I, I did not know his name. I did not know his story before we started this journey. And to read it, to read the, the clarity that he wrote with, the elevated language. You know, people ask me all the time, oh, this scene, did you, you know, so you, you made that happen? No. Or the language, you know, did, did you elevate it? Did you want to make it a little theatrical? This is the way he wrote. This is the way he spoke. This is an individual who's going through, uh, clearly, uh, an ordeal, but found beauty in the world around him and found the humanity where there was very little of it. And uh, people constantly and, and very kindly say wonderful things about the screenplay and I appreciate that, but the praise goes to Solomon. Um, uh, as a person living in 2008, it's very hard to imagine something like this if you don't have a guide and Solomon was the best guide I could have ever, ever imagined. When you first started talking to Steve McQueen, the, the director of 12 yeah. Years a Slave, and, and hu The Hunger, and a lot of great Hunger great and films. Shame. That's yeah, a really shame. special film. Uh, you didn't really have an idea for a project. You started talking yeah. about it conceptually, but didn't necessarily know about the book. How did you find the book? Ironically, his wife, who's an historian, found this memoir. And we'd been going over different ideas. And a lot of that was very good, because I you think that you understand circumstances like this, particularly if you're a person of color in America and these stories are handed down to you, and you really think you know the circumstances. In the beginning, with just the research and trying to find a story, I realized how little I knew about this history, about slavery, about the history of my own people, but more importantly, American history. So that was its own process. And then his wife found this memoir, and he read it, he loved it, he encouraged me to read it, I read it, I felt the same way, that it was just, uh, a very special story, not just because Solomon was a special individual, but you have to understand that it, obviously at that time to be a person of color in the South as a slave, to read or write was a death sentence. So comparatively speaking, there were very few first person narratives by individuals who had survived this peculiar institution. So within that, that story was very special. The fact that he was an individual who had been through this system, had the capacity to write about it, had written about it uh, within a year of his liberation, and this book had then been published. And, and this book had been a bestseller at its time, and then fallen out of the, the public consciousness. That was the other amazing thing. This book had been very pivotal in the abolitionist movement, and we lost it. We lost it, and, and I say that with a lot of shame. You know, uh, one of the things that I think you and Steve McQueen talked about before you found the book is that you, Steve in particular, was interested in the idea of finding somebody, a, a person of status, a person uh, of learning who knew the arts and, and sort of taking that person and, and, and putting them into this world. Why, and obviously, you know, that's, that's what we saw. Why was that important for you? There, there are any number of stories that could have been told. One thing that was interesting to us was that concept of taking things for granted. Um, I, I think there's a, a, a part of us that understands, look, these circumstances are wrong in and of themselves. Anybody who's in this room, anybody with a heart, can look at a story like this and, and understand that it's wrong. But I think it's very difficult for all of us who live just even a bit of a decent life 
to remember how we take things for granted. You know, this story, obviously, slave and slavery is in the title, but there are moments when the, in this story, this is about a father, this is about a husband who thinks, you know, I, I'm going to go with these two guys over here and I'll be right back. You know, mm -hmm. that's taking it for granted. This is a story of a woman who is a slave who can deal with many of these things, but I just want soap to get myself clean. We take those kinds of things for granted. One of the things that has really struck me in going through this process is just learning a bit of patience. You know, there, again, for people who are going to see a film like this, whether it's this film, whether it's Killing Fields, whether it's Schindler's List, you have a heart and, and, and you don't need to be taught a lesson. We didn't want to go in and, and teach just a lesson. If there are things that are learned in this, that's always wonderful. It's not just about teaching a lesson, but reminding sometimes about patience, about the things that are around you. Uh, nobody in here is going to be a slaver, I would imagine, but there are often times we leave the house and maybe we're angry at our partner, maybe we're a little short-tempered with our kids, maybe we're in the line at Taco Bell, it's not moving quickly enough. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And those are the moments when we go, you know what? Other people have endured. You know, other people have endured things. Maybe I can just be a little more patient. Maybe this person in line, maybe they're going through something too. That's, I think, what we wanted to achieve. And you can see that, I believe and I hope, in, in all of these emotional moments in this film about uh, when you see um, Lupita, the, the, the amazing actress who plays Patsy, and certainly you're moved with all those things that are happening to her, but in that moment when she's making those little husk dolls, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And it's about within this, that hope for family, the beauty, creativity that this person has. I think those are the reminders. Uh, and that's what we were trying to achieve. So when we were looking at Solomon, it wasn't, oh, this guy is somehow better, his circumstances are, are, are more unique to what other slaves had. It was, here's a person like so many of us who walk around and freedom and democracy and all those kinds of those big concept things, you know, we take it for granted, we take it for granted. And a lot of times we'll throw out things, oh, my rights and freedom are being taken away. Oh, the NSA is listening on my cell phone. My rights are being taken away. Give me health care. My rights are being taken away. What happens when your rights are really taken away? And what does that really mean? And I think those are the reminders. Again, not a lesson. Nobody in this room needs to be taught a lesson, but reminders are often very important. One of the things I found fascinating, I've seen the movie a couple of times now, um, is the plantation social system yeah. and the number of times that slaves, other slaves had to turn their back. I mean, you know, the fact that he hung there on his tiptoes um, and kids were playing. I mean, there's sort of like this, let's pretend there's not something bad going on. And the Alfred <laughs> Woodard thing, I don't even, the Alfred Woodard sort of at the top of the mountain, I mean, that whole, is that something that he described in the, in the memoir? Yeah, absolutely. Those, again, those scenes, the scene where Solomon is, 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 is hanging, uh, literally hanging in the moment, and, and people have uh, you know, commented on that scene. You know, that, for, for all the power that it's rendered with, on screen, and it is a powerful scene. You know, that is essentially how it was in the memoir. And with Alfre Woodard and her character being a woman of color who's in an open relationship with a plantation owner and has, in some small measure, been able to get some relief from her life, that happened in the memoir. But it was very important for all of us to try to paint a realistic picture of what that daily life was. If, if a film is going to be relevant at all, it's got to be informative. And were it to be just one note of, you know, this is slavery, this is the worst of the worst, and, and it's, we're just going to show you the worst of the worst, you know, it, people, you're going to come into a theater, okay, I get it, I get it, it was the worst of the worst. I, I think there is a level and a degree, and I put myself at the top of the list, not really knowing what slavery was. You know, it was not a hard day at the office, it was not hard work with little pay, it was not a, a, a mostly benign and sometimes malevolent master. The thing that we wanted to get across was, this was uh, a daily system. And when you see a moment like Solomon hanging and other slaves you know, just treated as daily life, that is a fact. One of the early things that really struck me in research was reading a plantation owner's uh, daily journal. And he would talk about, you know, we have to get this much cotton to the traders, we gotta get some new plants in, shot my nigger today, and it's just, it, it is on the list. And so I think sometimes people think, well, sure, the slaves got whipped, but it was a big deal. It was big when that happened. 
or, 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 or a slave was shot and maybe it happened, but it was a big deal. It wasn't a big deal. And I can go through all the, the old laws in the Virginia legislature or the Le Virginia General Assembly and when it happened, how it happened. I won't bore you with that. But there was no recourse. There was no law that would protect these individuals. And, and more importantly, there was no fear of prosecution. I mean, just imagine our society right now if there wasn't, I mean, um, we know what people are capable of doing, the worst of us. Imagine if you removed the fear of any kind of prosecution and, and what we would be like. So for individuals who often say, oh, you know, you guys, you played that up a little bit or you, you just want to be exhibitionists with it, um, we didn't even begin the show. You know, this is one story out of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of stories. Uh, I want to ask one more question, then we'll uh, take some questions from, uh, from our patrons here. The, it's interesting that if we think back on the history of American cinema, mm. this story has really not been told. Yeah. Um, I think most people learned about slavery from Roots, the miniseries in the, in the 1970s, which I think was you know, phenomenal for its yeah. time. Yeah. Um, but this film, I mean, as somebody told me the other day, they said, you know, Django Unchained was pretty cool. It's, it's sort of like that, was, that became the concept. I don't think this story has been fully told really until now uh, in terms of American cinema, and it wasn't, for the most part, Americans who told it. You know, Steve McQueen, the director is British. Yeah. Uh, Chiwetel. Chiwetel. Uh, Chiwetel. Edgeo Ford. Edgeo Ford. Edgeo Ford. Edgeo Ford. Edgeo Ford. <laughs> is, uh, is British. Yeah. Uh, Michael Fassbender is from the U.S. So many, so many people from the U.K. were involved. Why do you think the story was told by, uh, by uh, the I U.K. instead of outside. by... Well, I, you know, I mean, here's the thing. And, a couple, and, and, and certainly people have said that. I mean, the interesting thing to me, of course, is that, you know, as Americans, we are constantly telling stories about other people, other countries, other circumstances. And, you know, nobody says anything because we're, you know, we're Americans. We get it. We get the world. We'll tell you about your lifestyle. So I think sometimes, though, it takes individuals who may not <clears throat> be in and of the circumstance to have a little bit of objectivity. I mean, one of the things that's interesting, you know, this is, this is a film that does not comment always on circumstances, but rather renders them and leaves folks in these theaters who are smart enough and savvy enough to understand things to see and experience and simply have an empathetic experience. And that's very, very powerful. Um, I, you know, on the one hand, the most American of all of us, of course, was Solomon. You know, I, I'm, I'm a black man in 2008. I, I don't have an other better perspective on not just slavery, but the history, the circumstances, the geography, the politics of that time than anyone else from anywhere in the world. You know, this, that aspect of the storytelling is not limited by the country of origin or the passport. But at the same time, with that, these kinds of stories about the human spirit, about those who can endure, those who can rise above, you know, those aren't limited by a country of origin either. You know, we see these kinds of stories from around the world and they touch us all and they move us all because at our core, it, 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 to a degree it doesn't matter whether it's about slavery, whether it does, it, it's about a genocide or a holocaust, we have the capacity to feel things that have happened to other people. I think the thing is sometimes if we don't literally see them, you know, if we don't see them and are put in those circumstances, again, we need to remind ourselves sometimes that we are at our core empathetic people and the changes that have happened, not just in this country, but around the world that have been fundamental changes. We look at our history, we look at where we've been and where we are, it's because ultimately our empathetic nature has risen above in every one of those circumstances. You know, we as a people say that is enough. So wherever these individuals came from, wherever they originated from, uh, we have a capacity to to, to tell these stories, but more importantly, with Solomon as a guide, you know, none of this is easy, and I don't want to minimize anybody's work in any capacity that you see in this film, but I, I can say as the writer. Uh, with that man as our guide, you know, we, we just weren't going to go wrong. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, 
I just wanted to say, last year we had Chris Terrio, screenwriter yes. from Argo, and I never really understood what a screenwriter was, and I'm so fascinated by that, mm -hmm. and fascinated by what you do, you set the tone for the whole movie, and I was just wanting to find out a little bit about your process, about how, how you, you, you have the bones, and then you start putting meat on the bones, and anyway, screenwriters are, screenwriting is, much more than I ever thought it was. I, I would hope under the best circumstances it's more than just putting words on the page. Um, that's certainly a big part of it. Uh, the words you hear, and there, there's not a writer. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity last night to, to, to meet Robert Town, one of the great writers, Chinatown in particular. And, you know, as a writer, you're always chasing those writers who have the ability to, to, to write a line that people walk out of the theater quoting and they remember. And that's a great thing. But part of it, and particularly for me in, in doing a film like this, or doing a film like Red Tails, or I have a, a film coming out in May called All Is By My Side that's about Jimi Hendrix, where it's really uh, creating a Bible for people. Because you never know the other artisans involved in a film, you never know where they're going to come into the film, at what, what point, and how much time they're going to have to be able to really understand, not just, again, the words on the page, but the totality of the storytelling. So as you say, ma'am, part of it is just getting that structure together, but then real, really building it out. You know, what are, what are the sounds that may be in this scene? What, 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 what are some of the production values? And that, for me, is not to dictate to other people, you need to make it like this, you need to make it like that, but as a, as a jumping off point. You know, it, it, when, you, when you read things, you want to have a complete understanding. So I try to provide the words that I hope touch people and understanding for the artisans that come along. But if anything else, this is just this is a, a complete guide and where individuals choose to go with that, that's up to them. But I, I want to try to execute as much as possible in the script. Yes, ma'am. First of all, the film was fantastic. Thank you. Just overwhelmed. I'm very curious how you chose not to show passing of time with the seasons and the people growing obviously older or the kids growing older. Was that a conscious choice you made, the director made, or how was that established? That, that was a choice that, that we all, I think, worked toward in, in the execution. That concept that you know, time, as oppressive as it can be for some of us, you know, it is a luxury. Uh, in that, well, I, I got to go pick up the kids, or I have a meeting, or the friends are coming over, and we, we got to have dinner done. You know, time is, are those demarcations of things that we have to do because we have responsibilities. And when those responsibilities are lost, or more importantly, when they're removed from us, you know, there's very little time. It's, it's get up, it's, it's work, it's hopefully get some sleep. If, if someone doesn't come in and interrupt my night, all of a sudden a Sunday comes along, you have a bit of time to yourself, but maybe someone will call you back, or maybe you have to do this. And it wasn't until Solomon was reintegrated with his life, the life that he knew, and he could see that his children had grown, that they had children of their own, that his wife had aged, that I would say in concept we wanted to then say, time has passed again. If you can, you know, it's like a, to a degree like a sci-fi movie where you go into hibernation, and your circumstances, you know, you can look at yourself in the mirror every day and you don't really see that you moved on, but suddenly, you get back with your, your, your friends from high school or college, or whatever, and it's like, oh, wow, we, we've all moved on. That was the sense we wanted to get, not just throw up title cards. It's a month. Oh, you should feel like this. You should feel like that because we're telling you a month has passed, two months, or a year. But you're in this experience, you're in this experience, and then, oh, my God, it's 12 years. You know, I, yeah, I also thought that, you know, it was 12 years, but you clearly in the now you must have chosen from the novel sort of the moments or the incidents that you were yeah. really going to settle into and then just live through those incidents as opposed to becoming kind of episodic through it. It felt like it was a series of moments, I think. I, one of the things that I wanted to avoid just in having read the memoir and how Solomon laid his story out was those conventional arcs or those kind of forced heroic arcs. Uh, Solomon, because of his circumstance, could not have a heroic arc in a traditional sense. And early on as a writer, and, and particularly as a person of color, you know, that bothered me. I, you know, it's like, Solomon, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? That was one of the first things I had to get over. You know, I had to get over me. So it wasn't about me or how I wanted the story to lay out. This was his life. And so, no, there were not some conventional arcs. But it was very experiential. And I think, again, innately we all understand experiencing life because we do it every day. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hello. 
uh, I am Canadian, and this is the second time I've seen the film. There's a couple of questions that, that come to mind. Is Was uh, Sullivan bo born free? How, how was he educated? And what happened that they couldn't find out where he was buried? Like, what happened? That, I find that really kind of a bit bizarre. Yeah. Uh, well, two things. Uh, yes, so Solomon was born free. His, his father had been a slave. And this is a very important point to make, is that Solomon was not a freed black man. He was not freed. He was born free. And there was a very vibrant throughout the North in particular, I think, uh, small community maybe around New Orleans, but of free people of color, born free and had all, I mean, look, we're all born free. And we're all born free. But under the laws at that time in the United States of America, they were free individuals. His father had been a slave to a man whose last name was Northup. And so when he was freed, he took that last name. And, but his son, Solomon, was born free. His wife, Anne Hampton, was born free. So they were all part of that free community. Uh, in, in particular, this was in Saratoga, New York. Now, uh, one of the sad ironies of history is that uh, after Solomon was liberated, in uh, I think it was 1851, 1852. Uh, his, he wrote the memoir, uh, it became a bestseller. He became a pillar of the abolitionist movement. He toured, he spoke. There was actually a stage play version of this story that went around the country. Uh, he was a very prominent individual. People knew his story, but when he passed away and died, no one isn't sure of the exact date, place, what happened to his remains where he is, and people, there's a record of his wife passing, so it was not something that was, uh, uh, there was no nefarious circumstance with this. It was just truly an individual who, <laughs> who had a life, dropped out of that timeline, disappeared, was found, came back, became prominent, and disappeared again. And no one is ex exactly sure why, what the circumstances are, where he was buried. Again, there are records of his family passing. There are descendants. Some of them I, I had the opportunity to spend some time with last night. So it's not as if his family history just disappeared. It's just truly that moment in those circumstances, no one is sure what happened. It would be my hope, it would be my sincere hope that because of this film that there are individuals out there who are far more capable than I am who will go out and try to answer this question. He, he deserves it, his descendants deserve it, and, and frankly, I don't mean to overspeak, but I think we deserve to know. Uh, he's just a very, Far more than we know, he was a very pivotal uh, person in American history. Uh, yes, sir. I was just curious how this film has been received around the world and also in regions of this country. Well, I, I can say, uh, I'll speak to America first, it's been very, very well received. This was the highest grossing platform release of last year. Uh, our uh, distributor here in the States is uh, Fox Searchlight, who have been absolutely phenomenal in terms of keeping this film out in the public. And it is, uh, I believe, as of this weekend, in, in the history of, of Fox Searchlight, it is their uh, top uh, number seven release. Uh, so that includes films like Slumdog Millionaire and Little Miss Sunshine, you know, films like that, um, that were phenomenally successful. So in this country, it's been very well received. It's been very well received by region. Uh, it's done particularly, particularly well in, in places like you would expect New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, but also in Atlanta. Uh, it's played very well in Canada. Um, I can say in terms of around the world, uh, the film was just released in January in the UK, played phenomenally well there. I, I was able to go with this film to the Stockholm Film Festival, it played great there. Again, you know, around the world, uh, the, the circumstances, the particulars of it don't matter as much as people having that capacity to, to feel and be empathetic to what others are going through. So I'm, I'm very happy to say that people have treated this film not just as black American history, not even just as American history, but as history and history that's worth uh, living through and seeing. Hi. Hello. Um, I recently heard a statistic that today there are more people in slavery than during the Civil War. And that this particular movie is bringing more light to that slavery issue I'm wondering, is that uh, surprising to you? And do you ever think what Solomon would think if he knew that he was bringing only uh, a light to slavery in his time, but in a future time? Yeah, just I think everyone heard the question, but I just I want to put a fine point on this. The question being that uh, 
you had heard that statistically there's more slavery occurring in the world right now than at the time this film took place. And that, that is correct. There's more slavery going on right now than at any other time in history. Now, that can be sex trafficking, it can be forced labor, labor uh, but it is happening. Uh, largely, it, it happens in, uh, in Asia, but it is not exclusive Asia. It, there are thousands of individuals right here in the United States of America right now who are, uh, have their rights denied, are, are being forced to do something against their will. Um, it is a problem. I was surprised. I was beyond surprised. Do you think that that is something that happens in the past? And again, as much as I love this film, I think one of the dangers is people walk out of the theater going, well, that was then, and thank God we're not like that anymore. Um, it, it is happening, and it is a reality. And as far as what Solomon would think, you know, I, I can't suppose to know all aspects of him, but as someone who spent a good chunk of his life in these circumstances and spent the last years of his life fighting against these circumstances, I think he would really ask why they are allowed to continue. And I do not want to be a finger wagger, and, and I am involved in this system as much as anybody else. But you have to remember, in the slave system, there were people in the North who thought slavery was horrible but benefited from it economically and allowed it to continue. And in 2014, there are some horrible circumstances, but sometimes we benefit from it. And I include myself at the top of that very list, but I think sometimes we got to ask, what is that price of freedom? And what maybe a little bit more do we have to pay to ensure that people around the world can live well, live decently, don't have forced labor, um, and, and what can we do just in a minimal fashion to help change things? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Thank you for such a powerful film. I appreciate it, and I'm sure most people did. Um, as a screenwriter, you are living through those words and creating it for us. How do you get through some of that tough stuff? How do you psychologically get through each day, each moment that you're giving us that gift, but you've got to sleep that night? <laughs> You know, that, that's a very good question, and, and I would say the first time I read the memoir, I was incredibly moved. Uh, I, I, all the things that I've talked about this evening, um, how powerful it was, how incredibly well written it was, uh, the things that Solomon spoke to that I, I didn't know about, I felt all those things the first time that I read the memoir. And then after that, you kind of, you go to work, and you're just doing it, and, and I don't think any of us could go to work every day and just break down in tears, that's a, that's a job we would leave. You know, my, my father was a doctor and he used to talk about working in burn centers and people, you know, the, every day there were these people, horrible things that happened to them, but they had this ability to be there for them every day, every day, every day, and then there came a day where they just, they couldn't anymore. And, you know, with this circumstance, and I don't mean to compare tragedies, but, you know, you, you go in, you do it, you write, you write, you write. It wasn't until I saw this film the first time with an audience in Toronto where I understood the power of this film, and I really mean the film. You know, a, a script is one thing, and I'm proud of my work, but you all have seen a film. And there are so many people in so many departments who worked to make, to render this as fully as possible, from the cinematography, the editing, the score, the production design, hair, makeup, all of those things that put you in a moment where you forget for two hours that you're simply watching a film. So I appreciate every wonderful thing people have said about the script and the screenplay, but um, it, it would not be what you have seen, literally seen, it's one thing to read it, if it weren't for so many people who also either read the memoir or read the screenplay and said, we, we, we've got to make this just right. So for me, <coughs> you know, in the process it was, you know, I get it, there's emotion here, I just, I've, I've got to get this done. It was seeing it with an audience for the first time in Toronto where I said, this, this is powerful, this is special. And that is a special film, and it's special because of so many people who put so much into it. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> I guess I want to congratulate you on your screenwriting. Uh, I had Thank to you. look up what screenwriting was. <laughs> so this is my second time seeing the uh, movie, and uh, your interactions were just fantastic for me as a black person. Thank you. I see the effects of it today. My question is the DVD. When will it be coming out? And also, um, 
will it be coming out in the regions like Africa? I've had friends that have asked me about the DVD. Is it going to be in just the region one for the U.S.? Or is it going to be five for Africa? Uh, that's a very good question. To be honest with you, I, I don't know the exact release date of the film. Uh, I'm very happy that the film has remained in theaters. I mean, since October. So October, November, December, January, moving into February. Five months. That's kind of unprecedented. Uh, in terms of a run. So I, I, it, it certainly will be out on, on DVD. Uh, in terms of where else in the world, uh, right now, uh, and I won't get into the, the arcane things of, of distribution, but we have, a, we have a U.S. distribution, we have distribution with other companies throughout the world. So I, I would imagine those other companies are handling distribution. Now, I did a, an interview with a gentleman from South Africa, so I know the film is going to play out there, and I would imagine anywhere that it plays theatrically, there will also be uh, DVD distribution at some point. So I, I can't say with a surety, but I can certainly say with, with a great deal of hope that almost anyone anywhere at some point legally, legally, <laughs> uh, will be able to find this film in some fashion. Uh, Mr. Ridley, I'd like to ask you about uh, what efforts you made to um, make your story relevant to modern times. And just to give you a little background on where I'm going with this, I think collectively as Americans, we felt we moved beyond racism and um, moved beyond this idea of white superiority uh, with the election of President Obama. But then we've witnessed in the last several years um, a tremendous amount of anger directed toward him. And I was reminded in your story of this uh, character, Tabitz, uh, played by Tabitz, Paul yeah. Dano, how he becomes enraged with just the idea that uh, Solomon is smarter than he is, is a better engineer, a better carpenter. And I was wondering if you um, had any ideas along those lines to make your story relevant uh, in those kinds of ways. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. You, you ask a great question. I'll be honest. The only way that I even attempted to try to make this story relevant in any fashion, I got, I got two young boys, um, and I wanted them to see the best nature of a person. Um, you know, you, you can pick up the newspaper and see the worst in people. You know, you can turn on the TV and see the worst in people. But to see an individual like Solomon, who used all of himself to survive, his wits, his guile, his physicality, and again, uh, someone who wasn't afraid to stand up for him, like, as you say in the Tibiot scene, where he's not going to take it anymore, or stand up for people who uh, are weaker than him, like Patsy. Um, I, I, I never supposed that I, I, even with this memoir in front of me, that I could write a story that somehow was going to change the world or change the direction of politics in America. Um, I, I did believe that I could write something where, you know, you, you, as a parent, you always ask, you know, what am I going to say to my kids? What am I going to say to my kids? My kids don't listen to me. What am I going to say? Um, I wanted them to see this. I wanted them to know about this. And if it's something I felt comfortable saying to my children, I hoped, I hoped it would be something that other people would feel comfortable sharing with their kids or their family or their parents or their relatives. And um, in that sharing, in those conversations, uh, that would help steer things. You know, I, there's nothing I can say to Washington uh, about how to manage the discourse of politics. Do you know what I'm saying? There's nothing I can say. There, there are things that I would want to say to individuals, to you or to you or to you, about managing our discourse with each other. So that was the only way I wanted to make it relevant, that um, today, tomorrow, my kids watch this in 10, 15 years uh, when they're showing it to their friends, in 20 years when they're showing it to their kids, that those things, you know, uh, Decency will always be relevant. You know, how we treat each other will always be relevant. Um, uh, standing up for what's right will always be relevant. If I could do that, this film will be relevant, not just today, but, but hopefully you know, forever. Yeah, on, on the standing up for what's right for one another in the film, I thought the weakest character was the wife, was the woman, slave owner woman. Uh, Mistress Epps. And Patsy was strong to me. Um, she, her beauty was so strong and bold. In her, not just outer, but internal beauty. Um, and it was as if he wanted to be 
beat it out of her, mm. her beauty out of her. The woman was afraid of this woman. That was so sad because here are two women also yeah. in this story who could have connected, yeah. who could have maybe, you know, bonded. But because of the sickness, the toxication of the mind, the, the, the breakdown of the spirit, they, there's that happening even now, yeah. the breakdown of the spirit, we're all connected. Yeah, you make a really good point, and that's one of the things that we wanted to explore here was that there was a toxic nature going on. You know, it's one thing to just say, look, these folks are evil and that's it. For a system like this to work, for any of these systems to work, there's got to be a mass psychosis. And that was one of the things I, I learned early on about slavery. A lot of people think, well, you know, there's slavery throughout history. What's the big deal? We had slavery in America. Slavery in America was different from slavery throughout history, and it was a process from indentured servitude to slavery to slavery predicated on the concepts of racial inferiority. And you had to sell that to everybody. You know, you had to sell that to everybody. And once you sold it, you had to maintain that idea for 160, 160 years. And then after that, we had to go through you know, failed reconstruction, segregation, Jim Crow, the civil rights era, through the 60s, through the 70s. So we wonder, you know, uh, to, to this gentleman's point about how, how we talk in politics, we wonder why all of us, black, white, whatever, have some of these very calcified views of race and each other because it took so long to put these views into us. None of us are prisoners to the past, but we can't pretend that we're not informed by it either. So yeah, one of the things we wanted to show in this film was not just, okay, black good, white bad, but everyone is affected by these kinds of circumstances. Everyone is affected by it. You know, I wanted to ask a few final things. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in sports. It, it's come up a lot recently. Uh, the use of the N-word, which we heard on, you know, in the film a number of times. How, how do you feel about the use of the N-word? It's, it's... I mean, for me personally, I, the, I have to be honest, the word, it doesn't freak me out. I don't think people should walk around and say it every day, but if someone says it, you know, I know, they, you, you've told me a lot about yourself when you say it, whether you're black, whether you're white, you know, you, how you choose to say it. And I certainly, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm mindful of other words or other things that would be considered derogatory. So when people say it, you know, I think about, okay, if you're going to use that word, and again, whoever you are, you've told me something. Now, I, I have to be honest with you, at the same time, I don't want my children growing up being afraid of that word. Because people can say it to my kids, it's not true. I want them to know it's not true. You know, whatever, you can say anything, call my kids an idiot, they're not true. You know, you can just say whatever you want. So I don't want them to be afraid of that. I, I also know that with that word, you know, we've and I say we, people of color, you know, we've had an opportunity to you know, grab it and hold it and, and, and kind of throw it back in some ways. So I'm, I'm, I'm more sensitive right now to say what's going on with uh, the football team in Washington, where you know, the, there's not that same level of advocacy. You know, people are starting to go, oh, that, that's a slur, and we're using that for the name of a football team. And I think that's even different not completely different, but you know, when people say, well, there's a football team named the Seminoles, and you know, so it's okay, and go, well, you know, that, that, that's the name of a tribe. That's a little bit different you know, than, than a slur. So I don't have a real problem with the word. I have also have to say that word has not been thrown at me the way that it's probably been thrown at other individuals of, of another age. So I, I do think it is about context. You know, we use this in this film, it's used as a, as, a, as a pejorative, it's used to beat down people, it's also used as a greeting between people of color because that's the way it was. But it is just a word. But you is know, that can, the way it is? It, now or then? Now. Now, you know, I mean, look, people do use it as a greeting. People use it, you know, I grew up, you, you, you know, I'll say the, the more gentle version of it, but you know, you'd, somebody would say something stupid among people of color, you just, you know, oh, Negro, please. You know, you don't, you don't say that. You know, so it's kind of, you know, it is a complicated word, but it is just a word. You know, if you take that word out, you know, you can, you know, people now say the N-word, and I'm saying, well, you're still saying the word. If, if, you know, if somebody walks down the street and says, oh, man, you dirty N-word, I'm going, okay, well, so you can't, you know, it's not just about the word, it's the intent and who's yeah. using it and who's coming at you with it. 
Um, and, and I think we can't get caught up in that word that self, in the word itself. My concern is, you know, if you take that word away and you kind of put it in the corner, the only people who are going to use it are, are, you know, bigots and racists and people who want to do hurt. And also it's part of history. You can't put history in a corner. You can't say, well, that didn't happen. And, you know, it, it surprises me. Sometimes I've written some things about the civil rights era that many people in this room were in it, you know, in it. And young people go, oh, you know, was it, was it really that bad? Was it, and I go, man, we, you know, take away the words, take away the circumstances, take away these things, put them in a corner. That's how we forget. And we can't forget these moments. They're all difficult moments. We can't just forget them. Uh, this film has been uh, compared by a lot of people. Uh, people, you know, some critics and, and people who follow film consider uh, Schindler's List to be the, you know, definitive film about the Holocaust. And the same has been described uh, for your film as being sort of the definitive film about slavery. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I, under, I understand that when people say it. I, I've always cautioned people, and I think sometimes I overthink things. You know, we can't compare tragedies. You know, these things, whether it's the, the Holocaust, whether it's the, the Cambodian genocide, or what happened here, you know, those were singular. You know, some people have said, oh, this is, you know, it's kind of like Anne Frank. You know, what happened to Anne Frank was singular. All of these things are singular. What we have to be mindful of, of course, and I understand when people say these things, is that they are history, and they happen, and they happen for a reason. And more importantly, if we don't understand those reasons, if we don't connect to those things as people, you know, people say, well, it can happen again, but to this lady's point, they're happening right now. You know, people always say, oh my God, if we don't understand these things, they can happen again. They're happening right now. So the reason that individuals will tell these kinds of stories, it's not just, oh, well, here's some history and we're going to make some cinema out of it and we're going to get some awards. Uh, to get people to sit down and feel these kinds of things and really understand that they're, they're not that far removed from us. You know, the, the, the capacity for these things to happen is not that far removed from us. Then I understand why people compare it to a Schindler's List or, or Killing Fields or these other kinds of movies. And, and that I understand and that I take with pride because that was a movie, I mean, look, you know, you grow up and you think, oh, you know, uh, I, I know about the Holocaust, I know about it. To be in that theater um, and to experience those things and feel those things and go, okay, I'm never going to know what it is like, but I have a unique understanding. I have an understanding and I felt things that is so different than reading a textbook, so very different. And that the end of that movie, Schindler's List, where you have the survivors and they're putting the stones on the memorial and you're going, oh my God, this wasn't just a movie. That to me is powerful. So in that regard, if people are choosing to compare that experience that they had to this film, then that to me is one of the, the greatest you know, honors that you could possibly have. You have obviously received great acclaim for this. You uh, you won the Golden Globe Award. Yeah, best uh, drama. Yes. Best. Uh, you also uh, won the uh, the Scripter Award last night. Last night, yes, it was very um, the Scripter Award. I would say very quickly, it was is a very unique award that USC has been um, uh, presenting for about twenty six years, and they present it not just to a screenwriter but to the originator of stories. It's just it's just for adapted screenplays, and they choose. Uh, ones that they think uh, both the originator and the writer uh, contributed to cinema in, in a very high degree. So all of the accolades that we've received have been wonderful and very, very nice, but I've always felt like um, there's so much credit that goes to Solomon. And to receive an award that first and foremost was about rewarding the originator last night was so very special. That was very, very special. And uh, obviously, you've been nominated for the Academy Award. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and is that something you think about? <laughs> huh. I, we, I, I'll just say, and yeah. we had a guy here a couple of weeks ago, I won't say who, but he said, I want to win it. <laughs> Which I've never heard anybody say, but he said, I want to win well, it. I mean, look, I, there, you, look, there's no lie. Who doesn't, who doesn't want to receive something? Do you know what I mean? Who doesn't want to receive something? I will say this about my experience. So I, I, 
you know, it feels like it's probably about 50 years ago when they made the announcements. 50 years ago and two hours ago when they made the announcements. <laughs> but I was away in Washington, D.C. I had been asked to host an event with the National Association of Black Journalists. And on the day they announced, and then I, that night I went to, uh, the next morning I went to New York, and they had the big snowstorm, and I had to fly to London, and over the weekend I got the flu, and I was very sick. So there were all these things happening, and I really, your, your question was, do I think about it? Um, in that space and time, so many things were happening, and I was so sick. You know, you want to, when you think about something like that, you want to be in a good space. You know what I mean? You do, I mean, seriously, you just, you want to sit back and go, ah. So I never, I didn't, for the longest time, I didn't have that ah moment. And um, I went away to London, I, I got in a room, and... You know, I thought about it. Um, and... You know, I've been writing for 20 years. And when you start, you think you're going to win every award. You know, when you're a kid and you're 20, I'm going to clean up this town. Um, and then you work for a while. And you work, and, and, and work becomes its reward. It's a cliche, but it's true. Um, and then something like this happens. And like whoever the other gentleman was, it would be really nice to receive something. But five months in a theater um, to travel the world with this story to sit with people, to talk about my experiences, to hear about your experiences. Um, Good for you. you know, I, thank you. I don't know what else to hear. So I don't say that to take myself out of the race, you know, but with the Oscars, you know, you can't, you can't do extra sit-ups to get that award. You know, you can't <laughs> eat protein. There's, there's, there's nothing that can be done other than, you know, people seeing it and, and being moved in a certain way. And, you know, I get it. It is, it's art. And you, you know, how do you, how do you compare these films? How do you compare these stories? How do you really compare that work? So whatever happens, however it shakes out, um, all of this, every moment of it has been really, really special. I mean, I've never... You know, I, I was very fortunate to work on a film about the Tuskegee Airmen, and it touched me and it moved me. Um, but it, we we didn't show it the way that this film was, was shown. It just didn't have the the reach as, as films often don't. So this experience has been singular. Um, it, it, I mean, I just I don't know what to say. Meeting people, traveling the world with it, that people know Solomon's name, that they're not ignorant the way I was ignorant. You know, I, I don't I don't know what else and more you can get. You know, I, I know what else and more you can get, but um, you know, that will, if, if, if people choose to do that, it, it will be special and wonderful. I will say, you know, selfishly, I'm, I'm, you know, I think, when I think of this film, I think of Lupita, I think of Chiwetel, I think of Joe Walker, the editor, I think of, um, you know, people made this movie. So I think in some ways I'm, I'm objective about me and, and what I added and I'm hopeful for me, but, you know, I, I can't be objective about Lupita. I can't be objective about Chuatel. I can't be objective about Joe. I can't be objective about all those other aspects. I, I, you know, if the question is, if, back to your point, that other s gentleman, whoever it was, saying, I want to win. I want Lupita to win. I want Chuatel to win. Yeah. I, I want the film to win Best Picture. That's what I want. You know, that's what I want. Well, I, you know, I always say this, but when, when somebody comes to visit here, at Cinema's Palm Door. We work really hard to make this happen, and uh, we are so grateful when it does, and we are so grateful to John Ridley uh, for making this trip. Uh, it is, it's it's a masterpiece, and you played an integral role in it. Thank you. And I'll just say that last year, at about this same time, Chris Terrio was here for Argo, he was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, and uh, something good happened to him. So we <laughs> wish the good very good best on March the 2nd. Good luck, John. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for listening. It's much appreciated. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon.